Hello, and thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Neil Doty, and I am director of the Belief Ethics Program at the College of Business. Belief is dedicated to ethics education in support of the college's goal of creating ethical global citizens. We use several methods to achieve this, including events like tonight, where we bring speakers to the students to impart their lessons learned related to ethics in the real world. Tonight's event is the keynote address for our spring 2021 Belief Week. Before we dive in, I would like to thank KPMG for their generous sponsorship to the Belief Program through the years. Stephen Dukovic and Sean Morrison of KPMG are longstanding members of our Belief Advisory Board. They have demonstrated their support of belief in many ways, including reviews of ethics curricula, coaching of ethics case competition teams, and of course, financial support. Their support is the cornerstone on which belief is built, and we are grateful for their contributions. Thank you, Steve and Sean. And now I'd like to introduce our Dean, Balaji Raja Gopalan, to say a few words and introduce our guest moderator for tonight's keynote address. Before I introduce our guest moderator, I want to acknowledge and thank the Faculty for Ethics team led by our Belief Director, Neil Doherty, who you just heard him. Our faculty team is comprised of Wendlin Gao, Reza Razavi, John Pendergrass, Eric Michel, and Mark Mellon. I want to give a special thanks to our Faculty for Ethics faculty member, Dr. Pam Smith. Pam has been with the NIU College of Business for 55 semesters. I'll let you do the math on how many years that is. Pam has established a legacy of excellence, integrity, and caring in the accounting program, as well as the College of Business. Her impact at the college level has been phenomenal. Pam led the faculty team that created the building ethical leaders using an integrated ethics framework, which now we call as belief. Her commitment to helping students understand that good people can make bad decisions and her commitment to giving them the tools to avoid making poor decisions has had a profound impact at the individual, professional and societal levels. Simply put, Dr. Pam Smith's impact has been transformational. Pam will be retiring at the end of the semester. Please join me in thanking Pam for her commitment to our students and the profession for the past 55 semesters. It is my distinct honor to introduce the moderator for this evening Ken Quinn. Ken is a 1982 NIU finance alum who has spent his career counseling aviation leaders before, amidst, and after crises. From building internal cultures to managing risks and developing relationships with key players, Ken has helped C-level executives plan ahead to make the first hours days after a global crisis, less disastrous for everyone. Ken is currently a principal at the International Aviation Law and the General Counsel and Secretary of the Flight Safety Foundation. This is a position that he has held for the last 18 years. Prior to his role with International Aviation Law, Ken was Global Chair for Aviation at two large law firms, Baker McKinsey and Pillsbury Winthrop for the last 26 years. Colleagues and everyone that is on this wonderful panel discussion here, please join me in giving Ken a very, very warm Husky welcome. Ken, the floor is yours. Hey, Balaji, thank you so much for those uh, those kind remarks. I hope you noticed, by the way, some people think this is tiger uh, black and red for his Sunday, but this is actually husky uh, black and red with a little bit of white. I, I'm a proud alumni of Northern Illinois University, and Dean, you're doing a fantastic job. And so is this whole ethics and belief program that you have. We are really honored and very blessed to have with us two three-star admirals, uh, both dear friends of mine. Uh, first is, is Cutler Dawson, Vice Admiral Dawson, spent 35 years in the United States Navy. He was a Naval Academy 
graduate. Everything from frigates to destroyers to, to uh, cruisers to uh, being on the staff of the chief of naval operations to actual strike situations in the second and seventh fleet in support of our troops in both uh, Operation uh, Desert Fox and also in the Adriatic uh, Operation Allied Force. Uh, after uh, retiring from the Navy, uh, Cutler went on, he wasn't done. He spent 14 years as president and CEO of Navy Federal Credit Union, which at the time was the largest credit union in the world uh, with some 25 billion or so in assets under management uh, and is now by far and away the largest credit union in the world with over 100 billion in assets. So we're just uh, so pleased uh, to offer to the students at NIU and those listening uh, the wisdom uh, from all these leadership uh, positions. Uh, and with Cutler is uh, a good friend, Sandy Stowes, Admiral uh, Stowes, Vice Admiral Stowes was with the third class of women at the United States Coast Guard Academy. She spent 40 years in the United States uh, Coast Guard and everything from icebreakers uh, and to to commands and missions in the, the Arctic, in the Antarctic, uh, helping our wonderful Coasties all over uh, the world. And then came back some 30 years after graduating to be the first uh, female superintendent of the United States Service Academy. Uh, great distinction and ended, I believe, as the deputy commandant for mission support in the United States Coast Guard. So uh, Sandy Cutler, it's so great to see you and uh, thank you so much for doing this. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, let's start. You both had these fabulous careers from, you know, tugboats to, to icebreakers. Uh, fresh out of the academy though, it, it's difficult to get into an academy. Uh, it's difficult to, to keep with it. Uh, Cutler, maybe we'll start with you. What, what were some of the earliest lessons learned from your time as a midshipman uh, in the academy and going through that experience, which I think your brother then went through uh, shortly thereafter. Oh, Ken, uh, you know, probably the most significant experience in my four years at the Naval Academy uh, uh, was the concept that they taught that there were only four acceptable answers to any question. And and those, those answers are yes, no, no excuse, and I'll find out. Uh, the first two are pretty evident, but that, uh, let me just talk a little bit about for a second on the second two. <clears throat> no excuse means that when you make a mistake on something that you're doing, you own that mistake. You don't try to blame other people. You don't try to say you didn't have enough resources. You didn't have this, that, or the other thing. You just say, there's no excuse. I will do better the next time. Andy, uh, when you went through the Coast Guard Academy, very few uh, women, uh, what was it like? How difficult was it? Did you feel that you had to do better, push harder than any other cadet there? Thanks for asking. That's a great, a great question, Ken. When I first came into the Coast Guard Academy in 1978, I did come in with a third class of women. So we were only 5% of the cadet corps of about 1,000 cadets. And yes, we were in the minority, but... I was born and raised with three brothers. I was the oldest of the four kids. And so I had a bit of a head start, I think. And the lesson I learned when I entered the Coast Guard Academy was not really so much, you know, from a female's perspective, because everybody had it hard. All of us came, and I'll speak for myself, I came from a high school where I was in the top 5% of my class and uh, doing well. And I got to the Coast Guard Academy where everybody had been in the top 5% of their class. And all of a sudden I was very average, very, very average. And that was a huge lesson in humility. So I had been um, imbued with core values up through my entire life by my parents, my coaches, teachers, other influencers, but they were really put to the test at the Coast Guard Academy. And I really learned humility that that I had to accept being very average and having to work harder in an uneven playing field. 
So I found that working hard and persevering helped to level that uneven playing field in life because it's never going to be fair, completely equal. There's always going to be bumps that some people face and others don't have to. Uh, I never had, you know, calculus in high school, so I was way behind in, in that. So the lessons I learned were all about core values, maturing those core values at the academy. And then when I graduated four years later, I was in much better position to be able to perform my duties because of those lessons I'd learned. They were all values-based. It really weren't so much because I was a woman. Yeah, and, and humility is an interesting trait, isn't it? It's all too rare, I think, in some leadership positions that, you know, Cutler, you spent time in the Senate as a, as a young uh, naval liaison, I believe, to armed forces. And uh, I'd say in my time up there, I didn't see a lot of humility uh, from, from the senators. I saw a lot of people dictating what to do and sometimes not able to get through an airport on their own. Um, but tell us about uh, humility and also uh, maybe both of you touch on perseverance you know to we're now seeing that with the mars mission talk about perseverance but is there is there a tandem quality there and a great leader of humility and perseverance Color. um yes um and with that goes integrity meaning um you are who you are and you are who you say you are and um that's very important and that starts um, um with anyone with their resume. Um, you don't embellish your resume. You say who you are and what you've done. Um, probably many on, the, on this don't know that the military gives out ribbons for different awards and campaigns. And so you can see um, a person in the military and you can tell what they've done by the ribbons that they're wearing. Um, and it is a mortal sin to wear a ribbon that you did not earn. And um, let me tell you, people will figure that out pretty quickly. And um, but, but other in civilian life, we don't we don't see ribbons, right? I mean, right. you're just a guy in a flannel shirt uh, behind a beautiful mountain when skiing today. Uh, I don't know you're a three star. I don't know you were a CEO. How do you dig down and be a leader and, and inspire people to have that quality of humility, perseverance, and as you now say, integrity? And I guess, uh, and I think we were probably on the golf course and I said, well, what, how do you define integrity? And I think you said something like, it's, it's making the right decision when no one's looking. Is that something that, that you can develop, that you can build within someone as a leader? Or do you, and, and do you have to have that yourself? I, I think all of us have to think through um, what is our North Star? Um, in the Navy, and, and for Navies traditionally at sea, the North Star has been what we have navigated and guided the ship by. So what is your personal North Star? Uh, and you need to establish that early on in your career, uh, the tenets that you're going to live by. Um, I had two North Stars, um, I, I mean, two tenets that I lived by, and one of them was do the right thing. Um, and let me give an example of that. Uh, when I was at Navy Federal, we always approached a, um, a challenge with saying, what is the right thing to do for our customer, or we call them members? Um, and then let's go about building it that way. Um, and the second one, which was very important to me, was take care of your people and get to know your people. And, but Sandy, how do you get to know your people if you're doing the talking, <laughs> not doing the listening? Uh, and, and is that part of the humility, right? Is Because we, we all too often, again, we don't see this in some leaders. And I guess I'm, we've mm -hmm. seen a lot of political leaders with a lot of rhetoric and a lot of talking uh, but we don't see listening. And is that an important one, Sandy? Absolutely. I've even got a formula for how to succeed as a leader of character. And that starts with listening and listening carefully. And you have to actually stop and talk to people to do that and hear what they say. And you have to listen with the intent of being amazed. I heard this on a TED Talk by Celeste Headley. 
listen and, and prepare to be amazed by what they say. So don't just listen and while your mind is going around on what you're going to say next. Then the second thing you've got to do is look. So listen, look, learn and lead is going to be the formula. So the only way you can look is to get out and walk around, get out of your office. There's a book called The One Minute Manager. It's still popular today by Ken Blanchard that said, get out and catch your people doing something right. Because how often do we catch them doing something wrong and reprimand them? So you listen to them, you get out and you look at what they're doing, you understand what they're doing, you catch them doing something right. And from that, you learn and you learn how to lead those people. And that's humility in a formula right there because you have to humble yourself to listening and learning about your people and it not being all about you. And if they're not gonna ever speak their minds if you make it all about you. Yeah, and I said, I, I was uh, reading uh, Cutler, your, your book from the uh, C to the C-suite, Lessons Learned from the Bridge to the, to the Corner Office, available on Amazon, by the way. And, and Sandy's coming out with her own book June 1st, which we'll wanna talk about. But there was a point there, I think you were Deputy C Chief of Naval Operations uh, Cutler and had like a hundred billion dollar budget. Uh, but and how do you allocate that? And one of the things you did was you got out of your Pentagon desk and went to the Buji or, or Africa somewhere to to be among the sailors and Marines to see what their needs were and talk to them and listen what their real needs were versus what maybe some staffer is telling you in the Pentagon. I did, and I think you've got to do that wherever you are. Um, when, um, when I was at Navy Federal, I had even more leeway of doing that. I visited lots of branches all the time. Um, and every time I'd go on a branch, I would speak with every employee in the branch one-on-one. -on -one. Um, because sometimes that was their only chance to see me or talk to me. Um, but I learned from those visits. Um, and I brought it back to the headquarters. Um, and I had to be careful that you don't bludgeon your senior executive with what you would learned. You've got to introduce it very deftly, um, but it's so very important. And as a follow on, what, what I refer to it as going to the deck plates. You've got to go- What do you mean by that? These are civilians, <laughs> what, what does that mean? You've got to be familiar with your organization and how it works and what, what the people do that may be a level below you or maybe seven levels below you. Um, that you have an awareness that when you say right full rudder, how's that ship gonna go and what are gonna be the actions of the people that are manning it? But is there a fundamental difference between a, uh, a military organization, a civilian organization? You, gotta, you have a very clear chain of command. You have a very clear uh, mission or shared purpose in the United States Navy and the United States Coast Guard. Uh, you can't always tell a civilian uh, rightful rudder, and they say aye aye, and salute you. Right? They uh, civilians work a little differently, a little more slowly, a little more caustically. Uh, it's tough. Is it tougher to lead in a civilian organization? And how do you get them, you know, in a proverbial salute without saluting? Well, first of all, um, you know, saying rightful rudder is easy. There are other commands that are not so easy. Um, I'd like to say that. Um, I learned from my experience that a crew of a ship, when I was captain of a ship, and I'm sure Sandy had the same experience, if they believed in you and they believed that in, in you, their leader, that you cared about them, they would do remarkable things for you. Um, but if they thought you were just there to promote your own career and feather your own nest, they might just do what the minimum was to get by and no more. Um, and you know what? That's the same in a civilian organization. Uh, people want to be able to trust their leader. They want to be able to, to know that he or she is making the best judgments that they can. And when they do that, they, they'll do remarkable things. Sandy, did you see that? So the people under your command were, were more willing and able to execute your commands uh, when you had uh, a level of trust? And uh, how do you build that trust? Building trust and earning respect is an everyday duty that leaders need to engage in with their workforces. 
You can't just presume that you've got trust or respect because you have position power, whether that's in the civilian sector or public nonprofit or the government. You got to earn the respect and build the trust every single day. You get you do that by relating to your people, um, empowering them to do their jobs and encouraging them to rise even higher, challenging them, giving them opportunities and being um, intensely interested in the outcomes uh, that are personal for their own personal development and for the organization. And you create a sense of a shared purpose. And once you have a sense of a shared purpose and you are uh, empowering people to be their best, which everybody wants to be, and you're providing the way for them to do it, then people want to perform and they're going to want to jump in and take more responsibility because you don't want to be doing it. You want to stand back and do as little as you can as the leader and empower your people. So what if they mess up, right? I mean, we're all human. We all make mistakes. Uh, how do you, I think Cutler in your book, you, you talked about it, trying to create a safe harbor. Uh, a lot of uh, maritime terms here, but in, in aviation, we say uh, a just culture one where the frontline employees feel free to come forward to admit a mistake without fear of retribution, without fear of employment, employment uh, uh, retribution of firing or suspension, uh, without fear of going to a regulator and getting suspended. Um, how do you do that? Because you want to be able to delegate, but uh, people make mistakes, sometimes catastrophic ones in my experience. So you begin with not shooting the messenger when they come in and give you bad news. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then um, you follow up by bidding when you make a mistake that um, it's back to the Naval Academy for acceptable answers that you made a mistake and there's no excuse for it and you'll do better. Um, I had a young lady that worked for me at Navy Federal one time and um, we thought someone might be committing fraud against us and we, um, I directed her to put in some controls. <clears throat> and after a couple of years, she took the controls off. And that's when the bad guy hit us for about $3 million. Um, her mistake was she didn't tell me she took taking the controls off. Um, so she lost her bonus that year and got a reprimand. And um, it was about $40,000 bonus that she was due for. And you know what she did? She said, this was my mistake. I have no excuse. I'm going to work harder for this organization to, to make up for what I did. And so well, about a year call. later, some people me just, yeah, go ahead. About a year later, guess what happened? She got an out of sequence bonus for $40,000 from me. Good on you. All right. But some people, the, the, to, err is, the, to, to err is human, uh, to uh, to report it is not. <laughs> uh, right. And, and we see a lot of examples from, let's say, an unidentified governor today to an unidentified pre president of yesterday, of <laughs> people not admitting mistakes, not not taking responsibilities. We have the non-apology, the non-responsibility non taking, uh, non-admission. <laughs> You know, a bunch of legal mumbo jumbo saying to the extent someone misinterpreted my comments and my actions as being inappropriate, then uh, while I disagree, I, it just goes on and on. You just say, hey, did you mess up? How'd you mess up? Take responsibility. Uh, Sandy, does that resonate with you? Oh, absolutely. There's a great book called Extreme Ownership by Jocko Willink and Leif Babin. And uh, it's... Yes, it's written by two Navy SEALs. I, I Please right. believe me, I read a lot of books besides those written by military people, but extreme ownership, taking responsibility for your actions, even if you're at the end of an error chain and you're the senior person when it goes boom, and there's a bunch of people that before you uh, made errors leading up to that. So it, it all goes to accountability and responsibility. It all goes to being a genuine leader. There's a lot of talk today about authentic leadership, being who you are. Well, a lot of us don't want to really bring our authentic selves to work. We need to bring our genuine selves that genuinely care about our people and trust them and empower them and model the way by showing that you take extreme ownership. 
And they're going to want to do their best. And they're going to see that if you admit your mistakes on the pointy end, then they're going to be empowered to do so too. And I think I'm kind of repeating what Cutler said, but I wanted to get that in there about really the extreme ownership of um, accounting and owning what you what you do and taking that blame for your people so they have more um, faith and confidence in stepping forward to take a little bit of a risk. Yeah, and then they feel like you've, you've got their backs. Right? right. Which is an important part of leadership. It, I, I come from a lot of faith-based background and a dear friend of mine, Father Jim Greenfield, is president of DeSalle University. You know, St. Francis DeSalle says, be who you are and be that well. Yeah. Don't, don't, don't try to be someone else. You can get better, uh, but be authentic and be, you know, have joy in what you are and be an authentic leader. But let's take this to crisis management. So now we're, we got a smoking hole in the ground and, and, and people are gone or the, the, the ship has sunk and sailors have died or passengers in, the, in a crisis. Uh, what are some of the more important things that you have to do and, and how does the people that are in the, the center of the storm how can they best uh, take the right decisions without having the anxiety and the pressure get to them? Cutler? I think, first of all, you start with uh, be who you are. Don't change during a crisis. Uh, second, if you're a leader in any way, you have to remain calm, cool, and collected. Uh, we like to refer to it as the duck on the pond. You're just gliding around on the pond, but your feet are going a million miles an hour uh, under the water. And, but the, the duck has like, you know, a hundred media people surrounding him or her and people shouting questions and, and loved ones crying and grieving and multiple requests to go on to TV shows with pundits saying that, you're a terrible person and you messed up and they should, you should go behind bars uh, because my, my loved one died. I mean, that's a tough thing to stand up and be who you are. No, it is tough. But um, I remember when I used to get interviewed on the aircraft carrier enterprise, uh, when we were doing desert Fox, uh, one thing I did learn was they can't print what you don't say. So, True. um, Choose your words carefully. Think before you talk. And um, humor doesn't translate in a crisis. Um, and then, then the last point, when I took Navy Federal through the last recession, um, I was very careful that I never walked around with a frown on my face. I always had a smile. Because people, if they see their leader worried, they'll go, what's wrong? What have I done? Or what? Are we going to be in Are business? Are we going to make it? Sure. Yeah. And um, then the second thing I would do is I would take questions and I would say to people, I will tell you everything I know. I'll keep no secrets from you. Um, but is, then, isn't it important too, though, Sandy, to I've often counseled whoever's in that storm. And oftentimes it's not the CEO. You want to leave the CEO, frankly, to have some distance. It's maybe a spokesperson or it's the expert. I've often told organizations, take care of that person because I've seen people in the eye of the tornado who start exhibiting dysfunctional behavior. Normal behavior, people under stress, drink too much, smoke too much, don't get enough sleep, don't get enough exercise. And, and you see them and the camera's on and they have circles under their eyes and they're a little bit testy and they look like they didn't get night's sleep and maybe they're hungover. And it, how do we ensure that the people that are managing the crisis are doing it in an organization that supports them and they're doing it consistent with their family and their health. That's a great collateral question um, because we don't think of that very often. But I would say the person, the man in the arena, to quote Teddy Roosevelt with that, my famous, my favorite famous quote about the man in the arena where he is in the arena and being hard work, sweaty and being criticized, but yet um, rises up stronger. So encourage people that they are the one demonstrating the moral courage to stand in front of a crowd of detractors, media who are looking to make their mark and they don't care if they're putting you in this, um, the spotlight in the wrong way, misquoting you as long as they get their, their piece of fame. So you need to tell the person, hey, you can't take it personally. 
you just have to put on the, 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 the armor and don't take it personally. There's four kinds of um, um, depletion in my um, mind. There's the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual depletion when somebody's under stress. And if someone's under stress because they're working an event like Hurricane Katrina, Harvey, Exxon Valdez, one of these airline crashes that you've seen, there's going to be a period of time where they need to balance those four levers of spiritual, mental, emotional, and uh, physical exhaustion and depletion. And you as the supervisor can help find out where they need to be bolstered to even it all out and support them and have their back. And, and how important, not just to get through a crisis, but also in management, your strategic direction is boldness and decisiveness. You know, Sandy, you and I were we're blessed to have a similar mentor in Secretary Sam Skinner, who came to DC as a prosecutor and a, as a former US attorney and someone that wasn't really a politician and, and wasn't afraid to make decisions. But yet we've all seen examples of people in very powerful decision-making decision roles, not making decisions. They're kind of, either they're paralyzed to make a decision or they don't want any dirt on their feet. And you know, Cutler, when you came to Navy Federal, uh, I don't think you guys covered Air Force and Army. And, and so you had to break some China to get to that, right? And how important was being decisive and bringing people along to that new era, part of leadership? I think it's very important. Um, you have to have the willingness to make a decision. And then you also have to ha know that your information won't be 100% perfect when you make that decision. And that's okay, it's just the way it is. Um, but also, it, it's best to have buy-in when you go to make that decision. Uh, you mentioned Navy Federal, we decided to, to grow, and I brought the idea up uh, to my senior executives to add the Army and the Air Force to our membership base. When I did at that meeting, there was not one single executive that looked me in the eye. They all looked down at the table. All right. Yeah. And finally, one, uh, one of my most trusted executives spoke up and said, Cutler, it's hard for th them to think about expanding when they can't provide the service that's needed to our existing membership. Mm. And so I said, okay, let's go about doing that first and then revisit uh, the expansion. And that's what happened. And I'm told, by the way, that for your book, that you, you've got a larger print version for the Army and Air Force people. That? <laughs> Actually, that book was written for naval aviators. It's a little <laughs> book with big print. <laughs> big print, not the surface warfare folks. Let's go back to ethics and, and what we, you know, it ties into everything that we do. But it's one thing for you to be ethical and say you're going to make the right decision. How do you get the frontline employee to be ethical? I've seen multiple aircraft uh, catastrophes. Um, the value jet. Uh, there was a there was a mechanic who was taking oxygen generators off an airplane and putting new ones in, and these were supposed to be expended and just discarded. He didn't know what was going to happen with those. Um, but it's the work card said put shipping caps on them, but he didn't have any shipping caps. Put about five cents for a shipping cap. So he wrapped the lanyards around as he saw them come in, taped them, secured them, put them in a box, not knowing where they were going, the hazmat, whatever and made sure I got the air, airplane in an airworthy condition where the new ones are good. That box of generators got transferred back as company material to the value jet aircraft that was alleged to have initiated an enormous fire and caused the plane to crash in the Everglades with no survivors. So that person, a good person, I knew him, he was criminally prosecuted, he was acquitted, as was the company, but he made a wrong decision that was not an ethical decision, even though he was a good person, that had catastrophic consequences. How do we get frontline employees to be making the ethical decision? Sandy? So it starts with core values and every organization, I hope that um, JetBlue or ValueJet, I'm sorry if I got the name wrong, had core values. And you've got to hammer those home and make sure that every employee has internalized those core values. And you reward that by, by constantly having the senior leadership talk about core values and recognize people who demonstrate them. You've got to focus your 
um, employees on a shared purpose, which should be a mission, whatever, however you want to call it, but have them all pulling together so that they're all in it together. And if you let down your teammate, you all look bad. So that guy was able to operate independently and didn't have a sense of um, supporting everybody on the team, making all the entire airline and everybody who worked there just look horrible. So core values all focus on a shared purpose and a mission where everybody's responsible, getting back to accountability again, for the outcomes, not just the senior person. That mechanic is responsible for the outcome. And uh, I can tell you that we start our training in the military that way, in the accession sources, where you're thrown into a group of people and everything you do is as a team and you depend on each other and you can't let each other down. And that carries forward. You've got to be able to stress what your core values are, right? Like a lot of people know that you want to make money in a civilian organization. The military, you want to win the battle. Um, but not at all costs, right? It, mm -hmm. You can't cut corners uh, for safety. In, in, the, in the Boeing 737 MAX, there was a deferred prosecution agreement where it's alleged some technical pilots uh, didn't disclose the, the full envelope for the MCAS operating system to make adjustments that um, the FA certification team was misled. They were defrauded. Um, but they knew that had they fully disclosed all that, it probably would have required retraining uh, for the airlines. It would have made more expensive to buy that derivative aircraft. So again, they're trying to help the company. There was no evidence that management knew about it. And that was good because they paid a stiff penalty, but not as big as it could have been. But again, devastating consequences from people who we'd probably say weren't evil. They didn't have a bad bone in their body, but they were, they were balancing goals of, a, of an organization in the wrong way. Uh, so again, Cutler, how do, we, how do we prevent that from happening? Ethics training? Well, um, there's a couple ways. One, every organization is gonna have core values. And everyone in that organization has to live up to those core values. They're not just for the people on the deck plates. They're for, from there up to the senior executives, you, you can't have two different standards uh, of haves and have nots. Um, two, it's back to uh, our discussion about you've got to go to the deck plates and see what's going on down there. Now you won't pick up everything, but, um, you will set a tone um, that that you're you're looking. Um, you're not. A, I mean that you're aware of what they're doing, um, and then hopefully people will open up and talk to you. Um, I had a at Navy Federal. I had a, a chief financial officer, and I said to her one day, I said, "Look, I want to celebrate you whenever you bring me the numbers at the end of the month, whether they're good or bad." because we can't deal with them if we don't know where we are. And if I just celebrate and am happy when you bring me really good numbers, that may influence you to do some things that I don't want you to do. Okay, let's take some uh, some questions from students. Neil, do you, do you have some? Uh... Yeah, let's. Yeah. Uh, I, have, I have a few of my own questions that I'd like sure. to pose. And uh, anyone who has questions, go ahead and put them in the chat. So kind of an open-ended question. What does the term ethics mean to you? What do you think of when you hear that term and why is it important? When I hear the word ethics, I think of a sign above my workplace. And I don't care if that's a hangar deck, if that's a factory floor, uh, wherever you enter every day. Or now that we're many of us are working from home, um, the sign maybe that's in the room that you call your office. Ethics, written right there in bold letters every day. And ethics can be interpreted a number of ways, but it's a powerful word. And somebody told me that once. I didn't just make it up. Another um, admiral who I respected said, everybody needs to have the word ethics at the top of their door. And I never forgot it because it's the symbol of what's expected that transcends a definition. Okay, thank you. Uh, this, uh, this question comes from Cass Young, and this is for Ken. Uh, Cass wonders, did you know Sully Sullenberger? And if so, can you talk about his values and how they helped save the lives of all the passengers on the U.S. Airways crash? 
Uh, yeah, and I was involved in that and had a client that had a videotape of the of the miracle on the Hudson. I will tell you one thing, and I don't want to get too much into it, but I was doing a panel discussion with the head of safety for U.S. Airways, and I posed the question and a number of other safety officers of airlines, uh, with regard to the miracle on the Hudson, and, and I started my question, he said, Ken, let me stop you right there. Th that wasn't a miracle. That was one of our highly experienced and trained pilots applying his checklist in, in a manner that we expect during a crisis, nothing more. <laughs> to which I then said, okay, Captain, uh, with respect to the non-miracle on the Hudson, <laughs> everyone laughed, but you know, it was very true. Sometimes the ethical thing, the right thing, uh, and I think Sully would agree with me on this, is doing what you're supposed to do and doing what you're, you're trained to do and following your checklist procedure when you have whatever problem that comes up. Thank you. Uh, yeah, thank you for that. You know, I, I read, as, all, as we all did, read a lot about that incident. And I read that, that Captain Sullenberger had contemplated that possibility for years. He had prepared for it. Well, so did, he, so did Airbus in the certification of the airplane. And they were yeah. proud of that. They were like, why didn't it sink? Well, because, you know, that's part could, of our certification. Could make a water landing. Yeah. Sure. Interesting. Sure. Okay. All right. Next question, uh, Cutler. This, this will go to you. Uh, talk about how your reputation is formed, why it's important to protect, and what happens to you if it is damaged. Ooh. Um, your reputation starts from day one. It's... It, um, and it should be the most precious thing to you uh, that you don't cause a damage to that reputation. Uh, that doesn't mean you don't make a mistake. You don't, um, uh, you don't make uh, uh, not so good decisions. Um, but if you don't live an ethical and moral life, you're in, um, you're in jeopardy that, that you may not be the person that you really want to be. Um, and you should always keep that in mind. Um, uh, what what do my actions have? What impact do they have on other people? And are they good or are they not so good? It, you know, in Cutler, it can be applied in the even small ways. You and I have been known to golf a little bit together. Um, you know, golf's an interesting game. You keep your own score. Uh, what do you do when no one's looking? <laughs> right? You fluff the ball up to get the right line. Uh, is this something that you're going to say, I got a, I got a five and not a seven? Uh, because no one saw that extra stroke in the sand, you know. So ethics is a leadership matter. It just applies, I think, also to integrity in life, not just in the games that we play, but in the role that we have, whether it's as a parent or a, a brother, sister, or coworker. And I would also add to that that every in today's world, um, there is nothing that escapes uh, observation. Right. I, I was going to ask that question to uh, uh, to you. I'll ask it to you, Cutler. When is your reputation formed? On weekdays only? On between eight and five? On Monday mm. through Friday? Uh, when someone is around? When? When? That, when exactly is your reputation formed? You no, know, it's twenty four seven. And then also, you have to establish your reputation when you go to a new endeavor because they may not know. They may not be familiar with you, and so you have to prove to people that you are who you want to be. And what happens when you, if you allow your reputation to be damaged? Now you've got a bad reputation in your particular industry. What, what happens to that individual? Well, I think Ken touched on this earlier. I think the first step you need to have to, to take is admit to yourself and to others that you have made a mistake. And you don't lay it off on other people and you don't mealy mouth the words of apology. You just say, I made a mistake. <laughs> I learned from it. I am going to do better. Yeah, I've counseled a lot of organizations and CEOs who have had devastating things happen to their company, and, and it's an existential threat to their company and to their career and their reputation. And my sister, Sheila Simpson, wrote a book on the power of apology. Uh, I've counseled people before Senate Armed Services Committee or, or <laughs> Commerce Committee and disarm the chairman and say, you know what, Mr. Chairman, let me get off this hearing by saying that uh, we made a mistake. We should have done better. And we're going to, and we're going to apply lessons learned. Uh, and I've asked for an independent assessment and, uh, you know, no stone unturned. But I think I'm not here to, to defend that everything we did was right. Uh, that 
kind of takes wind out of the sails sometimes, yeah. uh, right? Okay, uh, I'll give some to Sandy. Uh, we'll talk about concerns of retaliation. So a, a, our students watching this are gonna be in the workforce in the next couple of years. They may witness unethical behavior or they may feel they're being pressured into doing something unethical. They may also feel that they could be retaliated against if they report that behavior. What, what is your message to them? My message to anybody facing that kind of a dilemma is demonstrate moral courage. And moral courage is doing the right thing even when everybody's looking and judging. I don't buy this moral courage is doing the right thing when no one's looking like um, Ken was talking about with a golf score. That's just basic honesty. I mean, I kind of expect that of everybody. But the harder right is moral courage and holding somebody accountable in front of people that might backfire on you. And I would say demonstrate moral courage, be true to yourself and look in the mirror at night and you're the one who's going to be able to sleep well. Even if you're suffering in the short term, you keep your eye on the long game. And I've had to deal with that. I see another question on the chat about that. Have you suffered in your career? And I did as a senior officer. I suffered for holding somebody accountable and my boss didn't want to hear it because it was better swept under the carpet because the organization was going to be put in the spotlight not just me or other people, but the whole organization was gonna be under a media blast because we had had this problem that we acknowledged and held someone accountable for. All right, thank you. Uh, this one is for Cutlers from Mark Riley. Uh, it says, I think your conversation with your CFO was great. Accounting and finance professionals should be, but are not always treated in that manner. How did she react when you told her you wanted to celebrate her whether the numbers were good or not? <laughs> Thank you for that question. Um, I got my reward about five years later when she retired and where she presented me a, a, a plaque that said, it is what it is. And because that's what I used to tell her, the numbers are what they are. We can't deal with it unless we know what they are. And when she gave it to me, she, she said, you made my job so much easier um, and that I knew that you had my back but also that all you wanted was an honest report from me. And, um, but that, I still have that plaque today. All right. Uh, next one is from Anthony Bruno. It says, not sure if this was talked about, but trust was talked about early in the presentation relative to its importance when it comes to leading people. If that trust is broken for some reason, can it ever be rebuilt? Ken, I'll give that one to you. Uh, if trust is broken, can it be rebuilt? It can be uh, rebuilt. Uh, Careers can be rebuilt. You can make awful mistakes. Uh, you can be prosecuted for those mistakes. Uh, you can have a harrowing life of living with the consequences of your mistakes. Uh, but I believe in a, in a, a forgiving God and, so, and sometimes even a forgiving media and time heals wounds. Uh, but when you break trust, uh, it's very difficult to get it back and you have to do it uh, piece by piece. And, and, Offering yourself up as an example of, look, I'm not perfect. I've made bad mistakes too. Um, let's try to work through this. And and again, uh, the flip side of the power of apology is the power of forgiveness. Yeah, I think uh, probably a lot of people uh, watching this tonight have seen the movie Catch Me If You Can, right? The Leo Leonardo DiCaprio movie about the, the gentleman who was um, passing bad checks, went to jail for it. And he ended up coming out and building a six, long, successful career helping the FBI. So well, he's a great, at, great example I, of that. When I was at Sidley Austin in Chicago, and a, a young pup started my career. One of my first cases was the Michael Milken, uh, Drexel Burnham Lambert fiasco, which a lot of your students don't know about. But it was junk bonds, and it was awful. And, and a lot of people were prosecuted, including Michael, uh, who had made a ton of money. Uh, and he spent time. And... He has come back and done great things uh, for, I think it's prostate cancer and established a foundation. He's raised a ton of money. He's raised visibility. He, he's, he's led, uh, you know, a purpose-driven life that's done great things, even though he had made uh, terrible mistakes and suffered the consequences. But the rest of his life, uh, I'll, I'll hats off to him. All right, we're getting close to the end. I'm gonna ask one more question. I'm gonna ask the same question to all three of you on the panel because I want your, your insights on it. So uh, Sandy, I'll start with you. 
Uh, the students watching this event tonight will be leaving the college of business in the next year or two, starting their careers. What is your advice to them for how to maintain the highest standards of ethics in their careers as they get started? My advice is be true to yourself and be true to your core values. Mm -hmm. Don't um, fall into one of the traps of the everyone's doing it trap or the um, I'm in a rush trap of rushing to something where you commit an ethical error or the um, hubris trap where I've earned this. You gotta be true to yourself and your core values and you can't let yourself take a step closer to the line. So I used to tell my cadets when I was superintendent at the Coast Guard Academy, you, your core values that here at the Coast Guard, honor, respect, devotion to duty are the line in the sand. And if you take a step closer, a step closer and then put your toe over, now you've redrawn the line. Put your foot over the next day, you've now redrawn the line again. You're far beyond the core values, but to you, it's the new line. Don't draw those new lines because everyone else has got the same line and you're just fooling yourself thinking you're getting away with something because it's gonna catch up with you and it's gonna make you look bad, your organization look bad. So just stand by your core values, believe in yourself and, and uh, don't fall victim to any of the ethics traps out there. All right, thank you. Cutler, let's go to you. I'm gonna answer that question a little bit differently for, for the young folks out there. Um, I'm gonna tell you the Raleigh Phillips story. And I want all of them to think about this when they go to their next positions. Um, Raleigh Phillips worked at Navy Federal and he was in marketing. And he went to, had gone to Southern Cal. And uh, one day I'm walking to the elevator and he happened to be coming in at the same time. And I asked him to tell me about himself um, in that elevator ride of two floors down. He was ready. He was ready. He wasn't afraid to meet the CEO. Um, he looked at me in the eye, smiled, and gave me the perfect elevator speech about himself. And guess what? I followed him for the rest of the time I was at Navy Federal. And um, by the way, he didn't let me down. Uh, but have your elevator speech. Don't be afraid to talk to the CEO. All right. Thank you, Cutler. That's great advice. Ken, how about you? I'd say listen to these two three-star admirals. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, just wonderful examples of, of ethical uh, leadership and boldness and integrity and decisiveness and honesty and what we've talked about, you know, following your North Star, giving others a safe harbor uh, to admit mistakes will set you on a path. Look, there is no, no one path. You know, all three of us have met uh, a lot of presidents, a lot of admirals, a lot of generals, um, a lot of CEOs from Fred Smith at FedEx to Bob Crandall at American, all very different leaders, President Obama, you know, someone who I knew as a young lawyer and see on the golf range today, you know, just there's no right path or one path, but these values that we are talking about will guide you to, uh, I think, success in the office, if we ever go back to the office and in your home <laughs> and in your life. All right, we had, thank you. Okay, we have one last question come in that I wanna take because it's, it's an interesting one from Rachel. Uh, and maybe this is for you, Cutler. It says, now that it's a year later, is there a difference in how Navy leadership views Captain Brett Crozier's request to protect the crew from COVID on the USS Theodore Roosevelt? Oh, good question. Um, that's, that's a very nuanced situation. Um, he tried to do the right thing, but he went outside of the family to do it. Um, and that's the best way I can explain it. Um, uh, it was justified having him relieved of his command. Um, you need to tell the people above you what your situation is. You don't go to the press and you don't go outside the lines to do that. Um, so no, there's, I don't know about the Navy writ large, um, but um, that had the right conclusion. Um, he's an honorable, good man, um, but the Navy can be for unforgiving about mistakes. If you run your ship aground, you're done. You're gone. So. All right. Thank you, Cutler. Uh, that's that's it for the Q&A. Balaji, you popped up there. Did you have any uh, last comments for us? No, I just uh, wanted to say how grateful we are um, to Ken, um, 
Sandy, to Cutler for taking the time. Um, we, are, we are very grateful that you took the time from your very, very busy schedules and, and uh, um, engaged with us. So um, I'm, I'm very grateful and my, my gratitude to each one of you for spending the time with us this evening. Yeah, let me echo that. Thank you to Ken, Sandy, and Cutler. I really appreciate you taking the time. Uh, your, your insights are incredibly valuable for our students. Uh, these, these events are always great educational opportunities for our students. We really appreciate it. So thank you very much.